I'm joined now by the Business and Trade Secretary, Kemi Badenov. Um, what do you think? How concerned should we be about a spy gaining access to Parliament? Uh, well, it, it's an extremely serious. Uh, it's an extremely serious concern. I know that there is an ongoing investigation by the security services, and uh, we have every confidence in them. But this is something that is of concern to all of us as parliamentarians because uh, this is uh, an area. Our legislature is an area that should be safe from spying. It's not the first time uh, that uh, we found people doing this sort of thing. Uh, and it just it is just a reminder of how careful we all need to be in terms of who we recruit and how serious the, and significant the vetting needs to be by Parliament on all the researchers in the building. What, when did ministers find out about this? Uh, I'm sure uh, security ministers and others would have heard much earlier. I, as, as a business secretary, this is not something that I would have needed to know uh, up until it became public yesterday. OK, so yesterday was the first time that, that you'd heard about it. Well, I became aware of it uh, when it became public. Do you think China should be formally classed a threat? Ian Duncan Smith thinks that the Prime Minister should be strengthening his language. Alex Chalk called China an epoch-defining threat, then, then saying it was a, a slip of the tongue. Would, would you describe China as a threat in, the, in, a, in that specific word? Uh, I would def define it as a challenge. Uh, I would define uh, China as a challenge because certainly from my job as business uh, secretary, working on international trade in particular, we see at international level just how significant China is impacting the economies of countries all around the world, most of all the ones that are, that are closest to it. Uh, I was at the G20 two weeks ago. There were significant difficulties between China and Japan. There were difficult conversations between China and India. So I think uh, across the world, China is, uh, is becoming a very, very significant um, challenge. You, so you say the word challenge, you've talked about difficulties. Mm. I mean, it, it seems like you're dancing around using diplomatic language. Um, Should I not use diplomatic language? Well, I just wonder if, if the government's putting our, sa our safety behind the possibility of trade deals in the sense that, you know... Well, is, well first is of all, we're certainly, not, we're, we're, certainly not doing any, we're certainly not doing any trade deals uh, with China, but we do have to recognise that China's the second largest economy in the world. It is heavily integrated with economies of countries all over the world. And the approach that we're taking is the same as our allies in the US, Canada, Australia. So we're not doing anything that's out of the ordinary. But we have to be very careful about who and what it is we're talking about. Obviously, Chinese people are different from the Chinese government. And it is important to be diplomatic. We shouldn't be using language uh, that makes people scared. We need to be giving them confidence. And I'm very confident in our security services. I'm very confident in the work that the government um, is doing on uh, economic security and investment screening. And that's one of the things that uh, I thought we would be talking about today, the good automotive news, which is coming, uh, which is coming coming from BMW Mini. I'll be going to their factory later, talking about uh, the good work that the government has been doing in order to secure investment into our country. But we are very careful uh, making sure that that is the right investment for our we country. Will, I promise you, we will talk about cars, don't worry. Um, but, but just before we leave China, I mean, fundamentally, is China a friend or a foe? Uh, China is a country that we do uh, a lot of business with. China is a country that is significant uh, in terms of world economics. It sits on the UN Security Council. We certainly should not be describing uh, China as a foe, but we can describe it as a challenge, which is what the Justice Secretary said yesterday, and which is what I'm saying today. I don't think we should be, uh, I don't think we should be careless in terms of how we speak about other countries when these sorts of things happen. And what is significant is that the Prime Minister said to the Chinese Premier uh, just this weekend, uh, he spoke about his very serious concerns. And that's why it's important to be able to have the engagement so that you can speak face to face and say exactly what it is uh, that, that we think in a way that will have an impact. Do you think China should be banned from the AI summit in November? Uh, that's a decision for the Prime Minister to take. Fundamentally, can this government be trusted with national security? You know, we have spies in Parliament, we've got suspend, suspected um, terrorists with potential links to Iran escaping from prisons under vans. Is the UK safe under a Conservative government? Of course the UK is safe under a Conservative government. And as I said, these are not incidents that are unprecedented. What is important is that we have actually found the person. The security services have been aware. They have been monitoring. This is an ongoing investigation, so I can't go into the details of that. 
But as we found with the, the prisoner uh, from Wandsworth Prison, he has been caught, and the Justice Secretary is looking at how this, is, um, this has happened. Let's move on to cars. You, you're here to talk about investment in um, the, the new mini factory. Mm -hmm. um, how much of this new investment is actually new money? Uh, quite a lot of it is, uh, is new money, but I can't talk specifically about the investment amount because that is something that I promised BMW because they want to be able to talk about their, their investment uh, later on at, the, um, at their event later today in Cowley in Oxfordshire. But what I would say is that we have been very clear that we had a plan for the autom automotive sector and that plan is generating results. This is, uh, this is just the latest. Last week we had Stellantis uh, opening its first electric car plant uh, of its kind in the world uh, in Ellesmere Port. We had four billion pound investment from uh, Tata for the new Gigafactory. We've had good, uh, you know, very good announcements recently from Toyota. So at a time when people are concerned about what the future uh, is going to be like for the auto industry, what we're saying is that we're doing a lot and it is working. You didn't help British Volt though up in Northumberland and then they, when they collapsed, put the the blame squarely at Rishi Sunak's door. Oral Nanjari, uh, who was the boss of British mm. Vault, said, we lost this window of opportunity. We're already behind East Asia. We're already behind continental Europe. We didn't see the government support uh, in order to level up the North East. Do you regret that, that British Vault didn't, didn't succeed? No, no, because the government has to be very careful with taxpayers' money. Not everybody with a plan should expect the government to dole out to dole out cash. And what was interesting about the British Vault, uh, about the British Vault case, is that they were struggling to get private sector investment. So, if a company is struggling to get investment from the uh, private sector, I don't think that that's when government should be rushing in to bail it out. This is this is not uh, this was not this is still a company that was in very early stages of planning. They hadn't built anything, and I think that the fact that it has struggled since is a testament to the very, very sensible decisions which officials in government and ministers took in order to protect taxpayers' funds. Uh, you mentioned Stellantis a, a short while ago, of course. Um, uh, they, Vauxhall's parent company and Ford, ha have called on the British government to renegotiate your Brexit deal with the EU because electric cars exported from the UK to the EU will have to meet these tighter rules of origin in, mm -hmm. in the new year. Uh, when that comes in, it means that cars are going to be more expensive on the showrooms, e e EV cars are going to be more expensive on, on, the, on the showrooms here in the UK. Do you think Brexit was really good for the British car industry? Well, I think we need to be very clear about what they're talking about. This is uh, a rule that was brought in with the Trade and Continuity Agreement. So this is our trade deal with the EU, has tariffs on rules of origin mm -hmm. if, uh, of car components if they're not from the UK and, uh, and the EU. So this is something that applies to both sides. It's not something that applies just to UK car manufacturers. It applies to EU car manufacturers. Yeah, I've been speaking, let me finish, you asked me the question. Uh, what I've been doing is speaking to all the manufacturers, understand what they need, but I've also been speaking to the EU Trade Commissioner. You would have seen reports that he agrees with me. This is something that we're working on. We just need to make sure that the rules which made sense uh, when that agreement was negotiated continue to make sense as the world is changing. When, when those rules were put in place, we didn't have COVID, we didn't have uh, the war in Russia and Ukraine, we didn't have the supply chain disruption, which is now making rules which were perfectly fine previously less so. So that is something that we're actively working on and we need to make sure that we don't put undue pressure on car manufacturers across Europe. It's not just a UK issue. But to be clear, if, we were, if, if Brexit hadn't happened, this wouldn't be an issue in the UK? Uh, if Brexit hadn't happened, we would not have had a trade deal, and so we would not have had those specific rules in place. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's really important to make sure that we talk about these things in the round. There are other things which we are able to do because we left the European Union, such as the CPTPP trade deal, which means that we have rules of origin uh, rules that work with a lot of South Asia, for example. So that's a new market that's opened. We can't just trade with the people who are next to us. We have to trade with the whole world. And if that means adjusting our trading relationship to do so, then we will do so. But as I said, this isn't a fait accompli. This is what having an independent trade policy looks like. When we were in the EU, we wouldn't have had any say at all on what the rules would be. And that's the problem that, say, German car manufacturers are having, where German trade ministers can't make those rules. They have to go up to speak to 27 uh, representatives of 27 other countries to work out what's best for them. We don't have to do that anymore. OK, just one very brief question, because I know you're tight for time. Um, we're about to talk to somebody from Morocco. Would you like to see the British government doing more to send aid out there? I know that some aid has just left Bryce Norton. Uh, 
Um, I think that uh, the first thing I should say is to express my condolences to the people of Morocco for what is uh, an awful, awful tragedy. And I know the Foreign Secretary is working very closely with his counterpart in Morocco. I do think that we should be doing as much as we can in order to support the people of Morocco. And I will look at what I can do myself as a Business and Trade Secretary in order to support. Okay, Kemi Badnock, thanks very much. Good Thank to have you in here today.